Good morning. Thanks so much for joining us for this month's US MAP webinar. Um, my name is Harrison Drews from the Emerald Communications Office. I'll be running through just a few quick housekeeping slides, and then we will get the show on the road. Um, everyone who's joined as an attendee is muted. Um, you're not going to be able to talk during this webinar. Um, you should default to computer audio and Zoom. That generally works well for most people. But if you're having any issues with that, you can always uh, use the audio or the mute button in your bottom left hand corner of your screen to switch to phone audio. That can be more reliable for some people. If you're having issues with your audio or any other issues, you can use the chat panel at the bottom, of, uh, the button at the bottom of the screen to open the chat panel and just chat me, the host. I'll do my best to troubleshoot your issues with you. We're also going to be doing Q&A in this webinar, um, and you can submit that at any point during the webinar using the Q&A panel, also found at the bottom of your screen. Just pop that open, type your question in at any point, and we will get to as many of those as we can at the end of the webinar. Um, I should also let everyone know we are going to be recording this webinar for posting on the US MAP website. Um, so just be aware your comments will be public. Um, you can submit anonymously, however, if you wish. All right, with that, I will hand it over to Joe Barry to introduce today's speaker. Joe. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the US MAP webinar. It's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce our speaker for today, Henry Snaith. Um, I've had a chance to interact with Henry over the number of years and uh, uh, and indeed, I have a, a director's fellow postdoc, Kelly Shute, who did his PhD with Henry. And I, in fact, asked Kelly, you know, for an anecdote that I could share with everybody in, in introducing him. And, you know, he's like, oh, I have lots of anecdotes, but I'm not sure which one would be appropriate, which I thought was perhaps the best anecdote I could provide. Um, you know, Henry has, has uh, been a pioneer in the field of metal halide perovskite systems, you know, being part of the team that really recognized their opportunity for application in PV. In particular, he's you know, a fellow of the Royal Society of London, among other things. Um, but most importantly, perhaps in the context of this, uh, he's also the founder of Oxford PV, uh, who's working really aggressively at commercializing PV technologies based on this. So um, in order to provide as much time for Henry as possible, I'm going to leave it at that and turn it over to him. So take it away, Henry. Well, thank, thank you very much, Joey, and thank you for inviting me to present to the US map um, consortia. Um, and I'm thankful that Kelly couldn't think of a suitable anecdote, or at least one that was appropriate. So um, I've been saved, I think I've been saved some embarrassment. Um, okay, so well, I'm gonna, well, thanks for the induction. As, as Joey said, I've sort of got two roles. One is as co-founder and chief scientific officer of Oxford Photovoltaics, and the other is as a professor of physics at Oxford University. So I'm gonna be um, presenting you some of both of the sort of work we've been doing in, in the university and in Oxford PV related to metal halide perovskites. So seeing as this is, I think this is your last seminar before Christmas, I'll, I'll start off um, really as a sort of recap, just to remind you what we're here about. It's about perovskites. Of course, this is a consortium working on perovskites, so I don't expect to have to tell you what they are, but I'll just um, sort of talk through some of the key steps. Henry, some of the key. Your... Do you have your slide shared? Because at the moment, ah, I'm still seeing oh God. you. Okay, yeah, no, typical um, Zoom error 101. And just for the record, Kelly did come up with a suitable anecdote, by the way, but I just don't <laughs> <Okay. know that, laughs> <No. so. laughs> That's good. Okay, he's off the hook. <laughs> okay, so um, can you can you see my slides now, Joey? Great. Yep, all good. Okay, so perovskites, you know what perovskites are, but I'm just going to run through some of the key um, sort of breakthroughs we've made sort of in this on this path towards industrialization of these materials. Um, of course, these materials, the lead halide perovskites first reported in 1892, um, perovskite itself, calcium titanate first discovered or identified in 1839. And there's the seminal paper from Tom Miyasaka and his group in 2009, um, using these materials as sensitizers in what were then disensitized solar cells or an adaptation of the disensitized solar cells to form a perovskite sensitized solar cells. So coincidentally, I think a lot of, a lot of advances in science happen serendipitously, and we like to think we're all very clever, um, but in, in reality, chance probably plays more of an important role 
than intelligence, or at least you have to have enough intelligence to recognize when you're onto a good thing. Um, our starting point for perovskites is sort of summarized on these two little scribbled notes, which really is literally our starting point for perovskites. These are the notes that Taku Murakami, my collaborator from Tuan University, um, managed to um, extract from uh, from Akiro Kojima, who's the first postdoc on um, on the, the 2009 paper, the first author, sorry, on the 2009 paper. And um, this was the starting point of how, how do we make methyl ammonium lead iodide or lead bromide um, to, to start to look at these. And we, we started looking at these in a collaborative project in the solids, what were then the solid state disensitized solar cells. Um, so I had a student, Mike Lee, I sent to um, Japan on a collaborative project with Taku, and we started this work. Um, when Mike returned to Oxford, um, we started trying to make devices and they actually worked. And in our first device where we put these perovskites into TiO2, we already got a 6% efficient cell. And that seems pretty paltry by today's standards, but that was our lab record at the time. We'd never made an, made, we'd never constructed a solar cell with higher efficiency. So we were already pretty blown away that this material, the first time we used it, delivered 6%. But the first, the first paper we published the, the, we made a sort of number of further advances. And the one thing we noticed was that if we replace this TiO2 that was an N-type charge conductor, an electron conductor, with just an insulating scaffold, alumina, we found we got a big step up in open circuit voltage and actually a, quite a significant increase in efficiency. So already over 10% efficiency. And this was surprising at the time because we thought these perovskite materials were good at absorbing light. We didn't know they could really transport um, free carriers or, or even excitons. At the time, we thought they might be excitonic materials and then maybe, maybe the charge is transported in, in, in bound electron hole pairs. But it, it turned out pretty quickly that that wasn't the case and we could construct these simple planar heterojunction devices with a solid slab of polycrystalline perovskite sandwiched between N and P-type contacts. This is the sort of archetypical so-called NIP cell where we have a tin oxide N-layer perovskite absorber, and then this molecule spirometad is the P-type layer. I, I'm not going to say too much more about spirometad, but another um, rather interesting peculiarity is that this whole conductor, this is just just an acronym for a P-type organic hole conductor. At least in the academic literature, this is still present in some of the most efficient devices. And this was a hole conductor used in the solid state dye cells in 1998 was the first time it was reported by Udo Bach and Michael Gretzel. So um, it's, I'm very surprised that something better hasn't come along, but it seemed like this was already quite well set to work well with perovskites as well. Um, right from the start, a key issue or key concern has been stability and was stability. And when we first started to get efficient solar cells, they were so efficient, generating so much current. I, you know, I asked myself the question, are these really real solar cells or are we measuring some sort of photo de degradation, some photo corrosive current out of the devices? Um, so we couldn't make, the whole device wasn't very stable at the time, but we wanted to assess, is the absorber itself stable? And these are just some of the first tests. This is methyl ammonium lead triiodide made with some chloride doping. Um, these films, we just, we sealed them up with epoxy resin and two glass sheets, put them under the, the solar simulator for a thousand hours and just measured the absorption every so often. And the materials seemed to stay there. The X-ray diffraction patterns seem to be the same before and after, so it seems like the perovskite wasn't degrading, um, which was very good news. And I could start to get excited that we'd really found a, a real material that's um, going to be working in a solar cell. Um, moving on from there, there's a number of different um, chemical and compositional changes that have led to improved stability. Um, the first one was seeing if we could use other ions apart from methyl ammonium, other cations in the A site that would fit into the 3D perovskite. And um, it turned out formamidinium, which is a, just a slightly larger organic um, ammonium cation, can fit in, and also cesium, the inorganic cation. So, so shifting to formamidinium, straight away we found there was a big increase in the thermal stability. So these are um, photographs of films, MAPI, 150 degrees on a hot plate in air. It turns yellow pretty quickly. And as you all know, this is the sort of conversion from perovskite back to lead iodide, one of the components in there. The FAPI film stayed more or less the same, pretty much unchanging. So that was a good step advance in thermal stability. 
of the perovskite material. Um, other advances have been done by, in fact, um, mixing cesium with formamidinium and the, the so-called FA cesium perovskites. And here we get, we get improved thermal stability. And I'm not going to go into the details. Most of you are probably aware, but there's also some phase instabilities in both formamidinium lead triiodide and cesium lead triiodide. And by mixing the two together, you can overcome these, some of these phase instabilities. Now, I'm not suggesting this is the ultimate ideal composition. There's probably some issues here, and we know now, and I'm not going to go into many details, but there's lots of potential issues on homogeneity, um, phase compositions, things that can happen and go wrong. And there's been you know, further work by others adding, in, adding chloride into here to make so-called triple halide. Um, Lots of people still retain methyl ammonium in here. So we have a so-called triple cation perovskite. Um, my sense is that's not a good idea, but I, you know, I may be wrong. There's some studies under certain conditions, the methyl ammonium can actually help to improve the homogeneity and hence phase stability of these compounds, but you're always gonna suffer from this potential thermal and chemical instability of the MA. So other factors that affect stability are, um, or other things that we can do to improve stability is to add further additives. So these are generically components that don't go into the perovskite structure, but have an impact on the perovskite. And there can be many different ways in which these additives can have an impact. This is an example of a, a large ionic um, compound um, I say large because this cation is this this piperidinium cation is too large to fit into the 3D perovskite. This has quite a, a positive impact on the properties of these materials, and we get quite a significant increase in stability, especially under light and temperature. And we also see an increase in in open circuit voltage. And this is just an example of some of the stability data from my from my research group in the university, where we take a control sample. We see it degrades. This is under 60 degrees in air, not encapsulated um, under full spectrum sunlight. We can see they degrade over a few hundred hours, um, whereas the devices with the piperidinium salt can last over a thousand hours, at least within, within um, 20%, with only 20% relative degradation. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about, well, we'll come back to these additives, but I'm going to talk about um, some of the things that affect the performance of the solar cell and really with a focus or an understanding on um, photoluminescence as a metric. And before I do that, I want to just tell you why, or at least give, remind lots of you why, as, as lots of you know this, so you can close your eyes and close your ears for a few minutes, but um, for others that don't, um, it's just about how a solar cell works. So we'll start here with a very basic picture of how a perovskite solar cell works. We have a conduction band, a valence band, we contact it with two, two charge selective contacts. In the ideal scenario, these will only let um, one carrier flow through and will reflect 100% of the other carrier. Um, so we have an electron contact and a hole contact. And, and the work function of these contacts will align perfectly with what we call the quasi-Fermi level for electrons or the quasi-Fermi level for holes. Now, these Fermi levels splitting occurs when we shine light on a material. So in the dark, we consider the material has a Fermi level, which is if it's an intrinsic semiconductor, it's right in the middle of the band gap. And as you know, it, it's, the, it's the energy at which your probability of finding an electron is a half. And when we shine light on the material, we populate electrons, we push electrons into the conduction band and we push holes into the valence band. And if you treat the electron population on its own, separate to the whole population, you can calculate what Fermi level position would you have, which corresponds to a given charge density in the conduction band. We call that the quasi Fermi levels for electrons and there's an analogous Fermi level for holes. Now this splitting of these Fermi levels is the maximum open circuit voltage you could generate in a sort of an idealized solar cell like this. So the quasi Fermi level splitting, you can think of as the, the voltage, the internal open circuit voltage you could get in this solar absorber material or the solar cell. So when we um, think about recombination events now, and, and just think about electrons in the conduction bands holding the valence band, how can they recombine? How can you lose that energy? Um, the band to band transition is the directly opposite process of light absorption. 
And because of that, it results in the emission of a photon. So the band-to-band -band emission ends up with the re-emission of a photon. And that process has to happen. If the material couples the optical field, so you get strong absorption of light, you have to have strong coupling for emission as well. So you'll always get light out. The additional paths of recombination are predominantly non-radiative, and they involve either sort of trapping of an electron in defects that can then recombine with the holes via the emission of phonons, or it could be via the emission of a low energy photon. So you might get some infrared emission due to trap, trap release. Um, and then we can also have surfaces, surface recombination or recombination at interfaces because we put new materials on. So at the end of the day, all these extra recombination processes cause the charge carrier population to depopulate faster and hence our steady state concentration of electrons and holes is lower and hence our quasi Fermi level splitting is lower. So basically to maximize the open circuit voltage or the quasi Fermi level splitting, we want to switch off as much as possible all these non radiative recombination rates. And in fact, we can calculate um, via sort of just thermodynamic an analysis what the quasi Fermi level splitting for a given absorber should be just based on its optical absorption properties in what we call the radiative limit. That's when there's no non-radiative recombination. And then we can also um, account for the losses due to the non-radiative recombination by adding on this term, which is KT times the log of the quantum efficiency for luminescence. So this term actually accounts for the non-radiative losses. And then we can calculate our quasi Fermi level splitting in the device. So the reason I've gone through all this is I just want to emphasize that measuring the photoluminescence from a film, from a device is actually quite a good way of quantifying losses or quantifying the quality of a, either a material on its own or when it's interfaced with one charge extraction layer, both charge extraction layers or in a complete device. Um, the other thing I should emphasize before I go on to just show a few, um, a few results and a few, few approaches is that one thing that we're really interested in in my re university group especially is trying to tune the band gap of the perovskites to enable multi-junction perovskite cells. So what I'm showing here is some theorized, these aren't real performances, these are calculated um, efficiencies for, for instance, a, a perovskite perovskite tandem or a perovskite 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 triple junction, just trying to remember which one that is, or a perovskite perovskite silicon triple junction. Um, and for all these different EQEs, you can see you need a solar absorber with a different band gap. So we're, we're, we've got a lot of effort in the university group focusing on, for instance, 1.8 EV band gaps, even up to 2 EV band gaps. And in fact, the sort of 1.55 EV, which is the as you make a triiodide lead-based perovskite, is actually quite good as a trip as a middle junction in a triple junction device. So I'm, I'm just going to come back to both photoluminescence efficiency and these piperidinium salts. And um, we've done a study with this 1.8 EV gap perovskite. So this is a perovskite that could be suitable for an all-perovskite tandem, a wide gap in an all-perovskite tandem cell. Um, and we're looking at the influence of this ionic, ionic additive, which is the piperidinium salt, at the P contact, the N contact, or in the perovskite itself. So this little chart here shows the photoluminescence quantum yield of the perovskite film itself. So this is on glass. Um, the control is here. We add this piperidinium salt, and we get a little boost in PLQE. It sort of goes up by about three or fourfold. But what's really interesting is when we put the charge contacts on, and this is the whole contact, we get rapid quenching in the, in the luminescence efficiency for the control. Now, actually, for a 1.6 EV perovskite, so a lower gap perovskite, we don't see such massive quenching with the P-type material. We also get a lot of quenching on the N side with the C60. We usually do see that with the lower gap material, the 1.6, but here we also see it with the 1.8. And actually, the P-type contact is quenching more so than the N-type contact. What's quite surprising is this, this additive that we put into the perovskite seems to significantly reduce the quenching on both contacts. So we can now convert these PLQE values into quasi Fermi level splitting, which is analogous to solar cell VOC. <clears throat> and what this tells us is that the absorber itself could give an open circuit voltage of over 1.35 volts, which would be pretty tremendous for this band gap. Um, 
But now if we go, if we put the contacts on and the ionic additive, that only drops to about 1.3, a bit under 1.3 volts. So this is really the target of the open circuit voltage we should be able to get for these band gap um, materials. And when we integrate this into devices, we do see the open circuit voltage increases um, with, the, with the ionic additive. And, and we can tune the surface a little bit further. We add some lithium fluoride in, and that can help increase the, increase the fill factor of the device as well, reduce the resistive losses. Um, <clears throat> but what we note here is this voltage isn't 1.3 volts, it's down to 1.2 volts. So there's a further loss. And this is really where we're presently at, trying to understand and investigate this. We think it's, it's potentially due to charge selectivity issues. Um, the difference here is we've also got electrodes on these devices. So trying to understand the losses induced by electrodes is also something else where further improvements um, should be made. Um, so then, then we ask the question, is it going to ever be possible to get to the radiative efficiency with these wide gap perovskites? I guess I haven't really set the challenge up enough because um, I haven't mentioned that with these wide gaps, we have to add in a lot of bromide and that tends to increase electronic disorder in the systems. Um, and we also, as I pointed out just previously, we have these problems of losses, more losses at the interface. However, if we look to LEDs, which is the, you know, the, the analogous device to a solar cell, except we put electrons in and get light out, put electrons and holes in, then actually we can make very efficient red perovskite LEDs using mixed halides and with the right ligand treatment. So the right surface treatment of the, these are nanocrystals in this thin film to passivate defects. And actually we, we can get external quantum efficiencies up to 20%. So we're nowhere near that with the um, photovoltaic devices. But if, and I'd say when we can get to 20% external radiative efficiency, the sort of open circuit voltages we'd expect is on the order of sort of nearly 1.7 volts from a 2 EV perovskite, 1.47 from a 1.8 EV perovskite. So this is the sort of band gap of the material I've shown you before, where we're between 1.2 to 1.3 volts at the moment. And for a 1.7, which is the band gap you need for perovskite on silicon tandems, um, nearly 1.4 volts, which would really push that efficiency um, through the roof up towards 34 to 35%. But I'll, I'll say a little bit more about perovskite on silicon tandems later on. <clears throat> I'm, I'm now going to show you some ongoing work in my group not related to making devices better directly, but relating to trying to understand what we've got in imaging devices. And again, it's related to photoluminescence. And we want to see what information we can get from photoluminescence imaging or mapping and electroluminescence imaging or mapping of the devices. Now, typically, th this is our setup we've been, we've set up in the lab. Typically, when you, when most people doing photoluminescence imaging will try to do it on a very small scale. So there's quite a lot of confocal microscopy imaging where we're trying to see really small things or you image the whole device. And what we're doing here is we've just set up a camera and we're trying to take, which is a very simple setup. I mean, this camera cost about 6,000 pounds or something. So it's not a cheap camera, but compared to a scientific, normal scientific instrument, it's very inexpensive. And what we're doing is trying to just image the sample. Um, we excite it with a blue LED. Um, we've got this beam as flat as possible, so it's uniform as possible. And to, to, to be able to actually image the absolute photoluminescence quantum yield, we just take a diffuse reflector with known reflectance and place it here, image the excitation beam, and then we put our sample in and image our sample. And by doing that, we calibrate every pixel for absolute intensity and then we can make a plot of, of PLQE. Now, what I notice, this is 0.1 centimeters. This is our 0.25 square centimeter device. We can actually image more or less, well, we can image the whole device. And what we didn't know at the start was if we were actually gonna see features on this length scale. And I don't know whether this is good or bad news. The good news is the instrument shows quite a lot of features. The bad news is we're clearly not processing ourselves very homogeneous. So I will note these are spin coated devices made in my university group. It's it's and it's um there is some inhomogeneity. So but what can we do from these images? We want to know what's the maximum amount of information we can extract. Well, we can clearly convert PLQE into quasi Fermi level splitting, and in essence get the equivalent of an open circuit voltage map, or at least a quasi Fermi level splitting map. Um, 
we can also think about um, the diode equation and whether we can look at trying to do, for instance, an intensity dependence of the quasi-Fermi level splitting and use this to determine the ideality factor, a map of the ideality factor of our films. The other thing we can try to extract is a charge collection efficiency or quality. And now if we take the if we take the photoluminescence quantum yield at open circuit, under those conditions, all charges that are generating are recombining. So that photoluminescence quantum yield or the total photoluminescence is proportional to the charge generation rate. If we go to short circuit, then the fraction of photoluminescence that is quenched relates to the fraction of carriers that are extracted into the external circuit. Right, so actually taking the difference between these, we can determine something that should be proportional to the charge collection efficiency or map of it. So it's a bit like photocurrent mapping, except without having to do any uh, measurements and rastering. But you can just take the image all at once. And it, it's not direct and someone can question me on the validity. Uh, a couple of things, we've used the overall images to, to try to reconstruct um, current voltage curves. This seems to work quite well, um, or at least it works similarly to what others have done macroscopically in integrating spheres, for instance. And what I also plot here is for a whole selection of cells, <clears throat> the short circuit current normalized to the Shockley quasar current density for that band gap against average collection efficiency that we estimate from this PLQE at open circuit minus short circuit um, images. So you can see it's scientifically, this isn't a very good fit. There's a lot of spread and I won't go into the reasons. We're trying to understand the reasons for this, but I think what, what we take, the take home message from this is that this is a sort of qualitative, not quantitative estimation of collection efficiency. It'll give you an idea of whether something's increasing or worse and what the homogeneity is, but it's not gonna tell you absolute um, definitive um, values. So just some examples of some of the things we can do with this. Um, these are perovskite films coated on different P-type layers, nickel oxide, poly-TPD, different poly-TPD thicknesses, I think they were here. And um, what we can see is there's quite a difference in quasi-Fermi level splitting, and you can also see a difference in homogeneity. Um, this is the collection efficiency or quality, if you like, and you can see that some films are much better, some contacts in the complete devices this is are much better at collecting, extracting charge um, than others. Um, finally, and this is something where it might be quite interesting, every time we make, we change parameters in our research, we try to come up with a set of experiments that we can tune each parameter. We maybe, maybe if we're ambitious, we try to make 16 different permutations, we try to correlate them and it takes a long, long time, many, many months of research to get, get enough data that we think we can say something conclusive about. And sort of taking advantage of the inhomogeneities, and we potentially have a system where within one image, we can get thousands of data points. And this is just an example where we've plotted from these images, we plotted the ideality factor against the quasi-Fermi level splitting, and we see somewhat of a trend. Now there's a bit of a width here. Now this is just a sort of first, first shot at these sort of correlations but I, I, I you know I asked the question can we actually do science in a different way where we tune properties almost like the combinatorial pro process for materials discovery can we tune the properties in a single device image it and then get a whole load of data to understand which factors influence what all from a single substrate um, but I'll leave that for mulling over going forward this is something that's of relative interest to those working in the area. This is just the, the we've just normalized these plots so we can see the inhomogeneity. This is PCBM coated on top of a perovskite film. There's lots of bright spots, um, which are where the PCBM is not quenching the luminescence from the perovskite. And C60, there's fewer of these. So these could obviously be quite detrimental to the solar cell if, if they represent pinholes or, or regions of delaminated um, fullerene C60 on the perovskite. But that's really just an example of some of the stuff we can do. Okay, so I'm going to change gears quite a lot now and um, move on to um, toxicity issues. And I should say, I've, I've, I, I have to apologize. I meant to put their name on here, but this is this is F. 
largely in collaboration with FNHW from Switzerland as part of a European project that I coordinate called, um, called PERP PV. And here we've been looking at the environmental fate of lead and really what happens to the, what would happen to lead if it leaked into the environment. So here, I think that, um, sorry, these are automated slides. This is just a, a, a picture of a perovskite module. And we're, we're asking the question, what happens if this all broke, if all this lead leaked into the ground, what would happen to it? Um, how much would leak into the ground, what the concentration would be, and then what would be the fate of that? So firstly, what happens to the lead once it goes into the ground? And does it matter whether the source is um, perovskite? Does it matter what perovskite the source is, or just a control lead source, lead nitrate? What we find is that for any source of lead, there's very rapid sequestration and sorption of lead into the soil sample. So these are samples where we've got a, a glass vial, actually not too dissimilar to my glass of water. And um, in it, we have soil, and then we put the solution containing the lead on the top. And then we measure how much um, lead is left in the top. And I, I'm not gonna do this example, but after 24 hours, you could certainly take a drink of the water and you'd be fine. Um, but um, um, basically most of it is absorbed into the, into the ground. So now the question is, so it's rapidly taken up by the ground. That's good news. Um, now the question is then what happens to it when it's in the ground? And we can look at um, different amounts of extraction of lead under different conditions and how much comes out. And I must, I'm sort of, I, I find these results very interesting, but I must sort of, uh, I guess, admit that I'm not the expert on this. So please don't ask me too many tricky questions at the end. Um, but what we find is that, um, firstly, most of the lead is quite heavily immobilized. And um, there's also no difference between the different sources of lead. So you'll hear quite often the people talking about, well, lead's all right, but perovskites have got water-soluble lead, so that's really bad. The point is it doesn't re remain water-soluble. If we go back here, this is sort of how long does it remain water-soluble? Well, a few hours and it's all in the soil and it's insolubilized and absorbed on the soil. So it's not, it doesn't matter what the source is. It needs to be dealt as all lead sources are dealt with. And once it's in the soil, it's going to behave very similarly to if it got there through any other means. Um, we wanted to see, in the worst case scenario, what would happen if we leached complete modules into the ground. And we assumed that the, a module of a certain area, 1.64 by 1 meter, 100% of the lead would, would wash off three, of a 300 nanometer thick film, and it would build up in a little trough of soil in front of the module that was 10 centimeters wide, a meter in length and just two and a half meters deep. So assuming all that lead goes into that little top trench of soil just underneath the module. And with those assumptions, um, what we find is that there's th this is the soil and the amount of lead in terms of milligrams per kilogram is just a little bit over 100 in total. Now, if we look at the um, safe limits, deemed safe limits, so predicted no effect concentration, at least in Switzerland, which is where FNHW are from, um, that is a thousand milligrams per kilogram. Oh, sorry, the, the legal limit is a um, thousand um, milligrams per kilogram, and the predicted no effect concentration is a few hundred milligrams per kilogram. And now if we go back to this, this graph here and we think well after 16 days how much is actually exchangeable and that's the fraction that in principle could be bioavailable and it's only a very small fraction and on this graph it's this little slither here so there's very little chance of even under the worst case scenario of complete failure that actually there would be bioavailable lead anywhere near the predicted no effect concentration. Now, what we wanted to also understand is, well, how much lead actually would get out of a perovskite module if it got smashed up? So 
firstly, or, or well, firstly, how much lead would come out under just normal usage. So we took some films. These are mock modules. They're not actually devices, but they've got all the layers in them. And this work was done looking at perovskite perovskite tandems. So there's a lead tin perovskite and a lead based perovskite on top of each other. They're sealed with um, with polybutyl rubber edge sealant, and then they've been left outside um, on on the the roof of FNHW's campus um, for about a year. And we've been collecting the rainwater that comes off and flows over them. And essentially, there's there's no more than the background lead, so no additional lead from the sealed module. So that's good. Sealing works. I guess we know that already. Um, interesting. My laboratory tree style sealing doesn't work so these are some of our university cells where we seal with epoxy resin and a cover slip and a, about five percent of the lead was released over six months so still not catastrophic but um but small we took some of these um mock modules and subject them to hail at quite high velocity um the the sort of standard sort of well this is a 25 centimeter diameter hail um ball and it obviously cracked the modules and then we put them out. And these ones are out for a further nine months. Um, and then, sorry, I've just had my, my younger sons just come in to say, hello, <laughs> um, Joe, I'm giving a... Sorry, the, the beauty of um, home lectures. <laughs> he doesn't care that there's a seminar going on. Right, there you go. Um, so these ones, I got to the crux point as well. And what, what's, I don't know, it, it's relatively surprising. Only about 1% of the lead is released in nine months. So these are laminated with an EVA style foil and they've got the edge sealant, but the material doesn't get out. So if we sort of go back to our worst case scenario, well, actually that needs to be now toned down by about two orders of magnitude. So there's clearly very little chance that lead would escape. And I don't think you're gonna be leaving a cracked module in the field for nine months either. You'll probably want to replace it because I guess it'll have stopped producing power. Right, okay. So the final thing I want to talk about before I open it up for questions is the sort of commercial activities. And um, you're probably mostly interested in this rather than all the other stuff I've talked about. Um, there's, a, there's quite a few companies trying to commercialize perovskite photovoltaics. You've had quite a lot of them come and talk in your seminar series. I'm going to say some more words about Oxford PV at the end, but um, just to, to quickly step through the different active companies, Swift Solar. Um, from the USA, you're familiar with them. Um, they're working on lightweight perovskites and all perovskite tandems, high efficiency applications where lightweight's important. Um, Hunt perovskite technologies, well, as you know, they've merged with 1366, and I'll come on to them again shortly. Saule technologies from Poland, um, again, working on lightweight, flexible perovskites, seem to be targeting building integrated PV. Um, GCL uh, Active, they, they announced a while ago that they were building a 100 megawatt um, production line for thin film rigid modules. And um, that is, uh, that the, the, there haven't been many more announcements for the last year from them, I don't think. A micro quanta, micro quanta are a startup in China. I'm working on thin film a monolithic perovskite. And um, they, they are yeah, active on the thin film. Tandem PV, um, another US company um, working on mechanically stacked tandems, it seems like. Sorry, I'm being distracted again. Um, sorry. <laughs> Just goes to show there are there are more important things than prospects. <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so well, I'll I'll quickly. So there's companies Toshiba are active, um, Solar Tech, 
Um, there's another US company I was only, only recently became aware of, seemed to be active in tandem um, perovskites. I think Toshiba are doing thin film modules. Sharp, it's a bit, a bit uncertain what they're doing, but they're definitely active. I presume they're trying to make tandems with their heterojunction cells, but um, it's not clear if they may be doing thin film modules. Um, Mitsubishi, we assume are trying to do flexible modules. They've had a long standing activity in organic PV and before that amorphous silicon for flex. And then cubic PV, which is the, well, it's not so much the new kid on the block, but the merged kid on the block, um, taking Hunt Technologies with 1366 curveless silicon um, wafering technology and seem to be focusing on perovskite on silicon tandems as well. <clears throat> so in the last um, short while, I'll talk about our activity at Oxford PV. And this is largely focused on the perovskite on silicon tandem with the premise that we can get much more efficiency out of a tandem cell or further multi-junction cells than from a single junction cell. And in fact, if we look at you know, commercialized industrialized silicon, it's been increasing in efficiency. The modules are getting more and more efficient, but there is a fundamental practical efficiency limit, which essentially is a brick wall for the single junction technology. And this is where tandems can give an opportunity to just keep progressing, to pick up the baton, if you like, from the silicon and keep plowing on and increasing the efficiency. And of course, I'd say the future is perovskite on silicon tandems. At least hopefully it's the near future. And if we're lucky, it'll be the semi-distant future. <laughs> and uh, maybe we'll go all perovskite multi-junction beyond that. But who knows? There might be another material comes on the scene. So I'm just going to say a few words about our journey with Oxford PV. So we, we found, I found, co-founded Oxford PV in 2010. And in fact, that was before we'd started working on perovskites and we were working on this solid state disensitized solar cell and thought there was an opportunity for, for building. So as the aesthetic advantage of being able to make colored glass seems like a, well, it is a decade ago. I was going to say, it seems like a decade ago. It was a decade ago, but time, <laughs> time does move on really. Um, 2012, I talked to you about the, the a breakthrough that we presented, published in, Net, in Science. Um, that really transformed our activity in the company, very quickly realized this is much better than that what we were working on before. And that there's an opportunity here to really push to higher performance. And it was really in 2014 where we started to see the opportunity for perovskite on silicon, an opportunity to not just um, deliver something that might be competitive with silicon, but actually to deliver something that goes beyond a, a new opportunity. And then we produced our first perovskite on silicon tandem cells in 2015. And there was a, there was a, a strategic decision in 2016 that we needed to scale up and prove some scale of production. Um, so we, we bought a facility in Germany. The company is originally based in Oxford, bought a facility in Germany to um, do the scale up activity. And then um, we've moved on since then. And I'll say, I, I won't, yeah, I'll show you a few slides. So this is our facility in Yarnton. Sorry, these pictures are a little bit blurry. Here we've got the R&D in the company headquarters. And in Brandenburg, this is where we're doing the pilot production and um, soon to be full scale production. So in Yarnton, the, the main difference is we work on small cells, three by three centimeter cells in Yarnton. We only work on full scale wafers in Brandenburg. Um, in, in December 2020, we reported that still the present world record efficiency, 29.5% shown in red, um, but actually the path to 33% is not too far off. This is what we need to achieve to get 33%. Of course, if it was as easy as slightly shifting a JV curve, it wouldn't be, it, we, we, it would be very nice, but it's not. It's gonna take a lot more work. But actually, if we look at the sort of progress charted over time since 2017, these are the, the, the record or the highest efficiencies in the company um, and the certified ones are shown here. So every year, sorry, this is slightly um, warped. Every year we've put on about, um, we, we promised or our target was to increase the efficiency by 1% a year. And we've actually achieved about 1.3%. 
So what do we have to do to get up to what we think is a, is, is a, a well, 29.5 is already pretty competitive, but 33 is extremely compelling. Um, we've got to add a milliamp on the short circuit current, 100 millivolts on the VOC, and only 5% increase in the fill factor. So individually, all these, all these components are achievable, but getting them all together in the same cell, the same structure, same recipe, same process of record is, is taking time, but it will be achieved over the next few years, I'm sure. So in terms of um, our activity and roadmap, we've had to manage quite a few different interdependencies. We've started with research and development to prove out the materials, processing, prove out that we've got a technology that's efficient enough, that's fundamentally stable enough as, as judged by lab-based environmental stress tests, and that's made in a way that we can perceive its transfer across to pilot production. And then we take the, any given process of record at any time gets transferred across to the pilot production line in Brandenburg, and we've been scaling up and, and developing the large area full, full wafer cells um, there. We made another strategic um, change, sort of 2018, 2019. Originally, we were hoping that we'd be able to develop the technology on a pilot line and license that to manufacturing partners. Um, but actually it became clear that that was a, a large variable and a lot of um, lack of control from our side. And we made the decision that if we could raise the capital, we'd actually go into manufacturing ourselves and thought this was actually the safest, most secure way of getting to revenue. So we, we basically decided we needed to go into large volume manufacturing. So we've, we've, we've raised the capital and have ordered and, um, and built out the factory premises and we're, we're installing the equipment, which will represent at first a 100 megawatt um, production line that is probably going to be closer. Okay, I know. Sorry, my elder son's just come back from school now. <laughs> which is probably, I did put a warning not to come and disturb me for the next hour. Um, th th this timeline says the start of 2022. It's going to be within the year 2022, but, um, but it's, it's, it's not going to be first module, first sales, commercial sales off in January, be a bit later on. Um, now, beyond this, we're already planning. This is, you know, as you know, this is a drop in the ocean in terms of scale we're planning how do we actually scale properly and get to the multiple gigawatt scale over time um, i will just show you that's the facility um, just a little bit more of an insight um, this is the layout We've got a heterojunction state region perovskite region we've actually got capacity to expand in here up to 250 megawatts um, but if we want to go bigger than that we need to find a new facility we do want to go bigger than that. That's a video, but I'm not going to show it because I want to leave some time for questions, or at least I don't think I am. A couple of technical things on the modules, something on the cells, sorry, something that you find quite interesting. This is the efficiency as a function of temperature. We actually have a tempco of minus 2.16 for a, this is a tandem cell of over 26% efficiency. Um, so that's pretty, pretty good. Um, that's a bit less than heterojunction cells, which is very pleasing. It means the energy yield should be very good from these modules. Another aspect to consider in the scale up is material supply. And this is just a graph for silver. So we metallize the perovskite um, silicon tandems with silver, printed silver lines. And this is the, the silver usage for PV shown in, in blue here. And um, this is the annual production shown in red. So by 2030, at the, at the progress rate of the industry keeps growing at 25% and nothing else changes, actually will be up to today's production capacity of silver globally. So silver could be a real issue. Um, advantage of a tandem is that we have half the current. So in principle, all else being equal, you might get away with quarter the amount of silver to have the same conductivity. But a, but a, a challenge is that we have to keep the processing temperature relatively low. This is partly because of the perovskite, but also for, at the moment we're developing it on silicon heterojunction that can't go too high. So this is sheet resistivity, for instance, for a, a number of different silver pastes 
against curing temperature. Obviously, as you drop the temperature, the sheet resistivity goes up quite a lot. So you want to be able to cure it as high a temperature as possible so that you can avoid having to use uh, too much silver or too thicker lines to reduce the silver usage. And with that, I will finish the lecture. Um, thank my research group. Um, thank funding that's come my way over the years, including some very nice grants from the ONR. Oh, I should probably go back. I remember someone telling me we're not allowed to show the logo for the ONR. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> maybe I'm forgiven because I'm not a US national. Um, <laughs> well, um, but there we go. Edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much. And any questions, very happy to take them. Thanks, Henry. Um, thanks for the, the really interesting talk. And uh, please do make sure to express uh, certainly my thanks to, to your boys and your rest of your family for uh, <laughs> letting, letting us uh, steal you for a little bit here. Um, we, we have a number of questions, both in the, uh, in the general chat as well as the Q&A um, that we can kind of go to. Uh, one, one that I think is a, an interesting maybe starting point um, goes back, it, it's quite technical, but it goes back to the um, pepperidinium salt, mm -hmm. uh, which is that, you know, you, you saw an improvement in both essentially uh, P and N type contacts. And the question that relates to, to that is, well, what, what does that really indicate about what the role of that pepperidinium is in terms of the, what, what the nature say of that trap is at that, that interface? Um, this, you know, you can you actually pull up the, the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 it's, and so so I was just kind of curious to follow up on what you think the role of the the pepperidinium really is. I mean, so certainly at, you know operationally you kind of highlighted that, but at a kind mm -hmm. of more basic materials level, what you think is is going yeah. on in terms of what the what kind of defects those ionic additives are really kind of addressing? Yeah. So, I. What so one of the main observations, which isn't necessarily related to this increased VOC, but is related to the piperidinium and probably is related to this increased VOC or reduced losses, is that it slows down this generation of I2 iodine gas mm -hmm. when you shine light on the materials at temperature. So take these perovskites, put them at high temperature under sunlight and they can evolve iodine gas. We know that it's part of the degradation process. These these large ionic salts seem to slow that down. So my interpretation of that, but it is just an interpretation, is that the, there are defects. And firstly, I should also note that this mechanism of I2 generation, we think it is trapping of holes on interstitial iodide that then forms an iodine, and then two iodine atoms meet each other, form I2, and that's the volatilized gas. So these these ions and it's it's most likely the piperidinium side we've done some experiments to try to distinguish between the two and um it's most likely the piperidinium ion sits and passivates or sits and blocks defects that would enable the in essence the generation of interstitial iodine iodide that's my perception so you reduce the number of interstitial iodide I, um, interstitial iodides, which would be present for hole trapping and then uh, um, on setting of the degradation. So if that's the case, then possibly these same def either those same defects, the interstitial iodides at the interface are also responsible for losses. Now you might think, well, they, maybe they're responsible for losses on one contact, but not the other. Can the same trap cause recombination losses on both sides? Possibly, possibly not. Um, it may be that there's a there's another defect that the the ion sits in that is also a trap for electrons, for instance, that um, that then inhibits recombination losses at the end side. So they, I mean, very not very satisfactory answers because they're just well, hand wavy. But well, um, it, yeah, yes and no, right? I mean, but but I mean, this this question about kind of these halide vacancies and then what kind of role they play. Both, you know, because because then there are the mobile ion charges and the screening mm -hmm. questions at the contacts as well. And yeah. So it's all kind of right this cascade that if you get it right, then you're good. But if yeah. you have that weak link, then somehow the you know the 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 edifice yeah. falls down a little bit mm -hmm. in the degradation mode. Um, yeah. All right. So let me let me. I'll, 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 this one's a maybe a little bit more of a 
a philosophical question, right? Um, so in the context of your Oxford PV work, right, you're, you're looking at vapor phase approaches there, right, for your active layer? No, I'm not. I'm, I've never meant, I've never said that, and I'm, I can't okay. say that. All right, so all right, we're all right, looking... All right. So let me, let me <laughs> Are you trying then? to catch me out there? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was not it. That, honestly, that was not my intent. But, but, uh, but I guess the, the question would be what your perspective is on essentially a solution versus, say, vapor phase. Because you have, yeah, have done yeah. some very compelling vapor yeah. phase work that's in yeah, the literature. Yeah. And, so, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, uh, so I'll first talk from sort of my academic perspective. Um, I think vapor phase is very interesting. In fact, we've just got a, we've wrapping up a new tool. I'm extremely excited to start to get first results on. Um, it certainly gives a lot of control over layer thicknesses, homogeneity, and everything like that. Um, one thing that we always observe and have observed is that there, are, there seems to be much faster non-radiative recombination in vapor-deposited perovskites than in the solution process perovskites. Now, this may simply be because there's been a lot more activity on the solution than the vapor. We can, it's very easy to search through a whole cocktail of additives, it's chuck anything in and then see how it impacts the material. And occasionally gems are found like this okay. piperidinium salt. And um, that's a bit more tricky with the vapor phase activity. But so, so, the, so I'd say there needs to be a lot more effort on the vapor phase to work out how to properly passivate and grow really high quality perovskites. But of, of course, on the, on the scientific front, that's something I'm certainly going to be doing in the group. In terms of commercial viability, I'd say both are entirely viable. I mean, looking at cost models for manufacturing, in fact, the equipment, okay, as much as it, it does install some capital investment at the first, when it's amortized over seven years and at high volume throughput, it doesn't really matter what methodology you use to deposit the material. As long as it's a high yield process, you have high use of material is really important. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, it's scalable and you can get the equipment. So whether it's, whether it's slot dye or thermal evaporation, I don't think really matters. Um, of course, there's, there's probably more challenges coating rough substrates with solution than vapor processes, but I, I wouldn't say that either, uh, any, I wouldn't say any of the routes are insurmountable. So, so sorry, Joe, I'm going to give you a very uncommitted um, response there. Fair, fair enough. Uh, um, I, so an, another question that we have kind of in the chat is, um, I mean, you talked about kind of the, the cell level uh, efficiency expectations. Um, could you talk a little bit more in the context of modules, like, you know, where, where you think, um, what you think reasonable targets are, you know, especially in the landscape of yeah. kind of existing incumbents and this kind of thing? Well, I, I mean, I can, I can tell you that our targeted, our production target cell efficiency is 27%. That's what we're targeting off the production line. And that translates to a module efficiency of about just a bit shy of 24%, um, which would be a, I believe, for a 60 cell M8, M8, M6 module. Um, something like 420 watts, yeah. 430 watts. So efficiency wise, I, I believe that the best heterojunction modules are going to be around 22% efficiency, just shy of 22% efficiency. And the PERC modules are sort of 20 to 21% efficiency, but they're, they're, not, they're not stopping there. They're still progressing. So, you know, there is this brick wall, but there's still scope. There's scope to get the, you know, basically high efficiency silicon modules, be it Topcon or Heterojunction. There's, there's certainly scope to get those modules up to 24, maybe 25% efficiency. But going beyond that is going to be very, very difficult. So the, the plan and the intention is to deliver the perovskite, the first perovskite modules, you know, a few percent better than the, best on the market at the time and then be able to then accelerate away but it's a it's 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 a tough you know it's a it's a high challenge the the rate of progress there's a massive increase in volume now of these more efficient modules and um, lots of manufacturers are establishing production in certainly in heterojunction and i believe topcon's also coming online yeah. so um we can't stand still so 
Um, Harrison just informed me that that we've got a hard stop. It sounds like it. They're, they're going to pull the plug on us at, in a minute. So okay. um, I'll take the opportunity to thank you again, Henry. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll throw out the last question I was going to ask you, but I won't make <laughs> you answer it because we were on a podcast earlier this year where you thought you'd be, uh, uh, you know, having production products uh, going out the door by the end of the calendar year. Do you, do you, my question would be, do you think you're on track for that? <laughs> so i won't answer that <laughs> <laughs> thanks again henry i really appreciate okay. it um 